right, let's, uh, let's pray before we dive in here. Father, thank you again for the time to open up your word and to hear and listen. And may we do just that today, Lord. May you shut up our minds and just other things that distract us and just keep us from uh, not hearing what you have for us today. Um, and uh, may you just guide this time now for your glory and for your good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're almost done with the book of Ephesians. If you remember, we started last September, and I think next... What are you laughing for? <laughs> well, it, we should end of August, end up, and so that's the plan. So we're excited about that. Uh, but this summer, you know, we could have finished a lot sooner, but we've intentionally just kind of gone slow for each aspect of the armor here, diving into this metaphor, the armor of God, spiritual warfare. We've talked about how the armor is gospel clothing, how it's a unit, how it's given to us by God and to enable us to stand against the schemes of the devil, right? We, we learned about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and uh, gospel readiness, the shoes, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation. There's just all kinds of things, right? Uh, lots of theology. Again, note the connection between theology and life. So often we get that so wrong and we think all that theology stuff, that's too deep for me. Not good for me. Those are for the paid guys. Those are for the guys that go to seminary and such, right? That could not be further from the truth. The reality is everyone here in this room is a theologian. Everyone is. Every human being, if they're breathing, is a theologian. Everyone has ideas. Everyone has beliefs about spiritual things. An atheist is a theologian. They have ideas. An agnostic is a theologian. They have ideas. So the question isn't, oh, man, do I want to be a theologian? But rather, are you a good one or a bad one? <laughs> That's the question. And Paul is deliberately going out of his way in this letter of Ephesians to not only give the church deep theology, which he has throughout the book, to form us, to shape our understanding about God, salvation, and life, but now he's showing us again how that theology helps us in our daily life, in our daily battle against the world, the devil, and the flesh, spiritual warfare. And so in other words, if we want to fight better, learn, understand, and apply theology. That's what Paul is getting at here. So we move on to the next piece of the armor today. Let's read the passage again from Ephesians 6. You should have this memorized by now. Um, we've heard it for six weeks now. Um, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which, is, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So that last line again, that's where we're at today. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Did anybody watch the Olympic uh, fencing? The Olympics fencing? That one hand, right? You saw those cute little rods they play with, <laughs> right? Called swords, and, and then they hit this little cloth armor, and it just buckles and bends all over the place. It's kind of fun to watch. Those things are kind of harmless, are they not? Uh, that's not the imagery here, okay? Not at all. There's debate whether, you know, the word here is a big sword or if it's more like a dagger. Uh, the, but there is no question that whatever Paul is meaning by this, this is something super powerful, super deadly, super important to a soldier. Add to the imagery here that it says it's the sword of the spirit. And just like that, we have something to talk about, something powerful. Paul is identifying the sword of the spirit with what? The word of God. So everything else, again, you know, belt of truth, righteousness, salvation, faith, readiness, all that kind of stuff. Here we have the armor as the word of God. And there are so many places that we could go to dive into this idea here because God has spoken. His word has been given to us. As I was thinking about this this last week and just trying to imagine the, the imagery here that Paul is giving us, this context of warfare, my mind went to that passage that we heard earlier from Pastor John in Matthew 4 and the temptation of Jesus. Right after he was baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, he goes into the wilderness. So fascinating to be assaulted by the devil himself. And the word incarnate, Jesus, wields the word like a scalpel. It is written, it is written, it is written. And what happens? The devil flees. And that phrase, it is written, is not exclusive to Jesus. Yes, I mean, he says it many times in the Gospels, but really it's all over the Scriptures. You look in the Old Testament, and you'll find, as it is written in the Law of Moses, or as it was written in the Prophets, Paul writes it. It is written all over his writings. Look at the testimony of the church for 2,000 years, appealing to Scripture, the Word of God, as a faithful testimony, right? 
Makes a guy curious, doesn't it? Let me ask you a couple of questions, and I'll ask you the main question. Why did Jesus, or the saints before him, and the saints after him, and the saints all the way up to today, what, what is it about the scripture that made them want to appeal to it? What is it about the scriptures that invokes such an allegiance, such a dependence, and such a submission and a desire? Why is the word of God called the sword of the spirit? Here's a key question today. Pretty simple question. Why are the scriptures a weapon in spiritual warfare? No, Paul does not give the answer here, so, but he does many other places. And we're going to look to one of those passages that Paul gives, a classic passage on the scripture. So you see it in your sermon notes in the, on the screen or in your Bibles too, 2 Timothy 3. Uh, this is also a text that many of you know well. Maybe, maybe you've memorized this. It's one of those classic passages about the scriptures. Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, but as for you... Continuing what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood that you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so again, that question, why are the scriptures a weapon in spiritual warfare? The first one, first answer, because the scriptures remain authoritative. Okay, the scriptures remain authoritative. A few years ago, when we were still living in Ukraine, um, I was sitting across the room. I, I got together with my Russian uh, language teacher all the time. Her name was Yelena. She was a brilliant, brilliant philology professor at the university, super well-read. We used to talk about religion, philosophy, history all the time. We would talk about serious things all the time. We both had similar interests, which was so helpful for me because it helped with my language development, vocabulary, things like that. She was a very, very strong woman, a very, very devout a uh, Russian patriot living in Odessa, right, as many are, and a very strong Orthodox woman, too. Uh, and before all the madness started ensuing in Ukraine, there were seeds of revolution that were sort of popping up in, in the Western side, and she was not happy about it. I remember talking with her about it, and she would say, she would say, absolute freedom is anarchy. We cannot live in a country of total anarchy. We cannot live in a country of total freedom. We cannot live in a country where people are doing whatever they want it will destroy society. And she would say, self-authority is anarchy. That's literally what she would say. It's chaos. And so her solution was a strong leader, someone outside of themselves to direct and give authority. And so she then would look to a man, I will not name him, but it starts with a P and ends with Uten, right? <laughs> and while not really aligning with her political views, she was absolutely correct in terms of practical philosophy of life and religion. Self-authority is anarchy. Self-authority is chaos. And it seems to me that that should be self-evident. And yet, is it not this sort of self-authority, self-autonomy, radical, radicalized individualism that we then are operating under in our country? Do whatever you want. You have freedom. You've got no outside control. No outside saying anybody. That's the mantra of our society. No one can tell me what to do. No one can tell me what is right and wrong for myself. No one can judge my behavior. You do you. How dare you say anything about that? I'm free. I am my own authority. And this mantra that has just gone crazy has turned into this irrational tidal wave of irrational crusading in our society. And the result is anarchy. We, we see it. Anarchy. Anarchy in people's lives. Anarchy in societies and communities. And this kind of freedom, this kind of relativism is simply unlivable. It will only lead to chaos every time. It's shown itself over and over and over and yet we think we're immune to it. But what about our spiritual lives? Okay, what about our spiritual lives? I'm afraid that we are tempted to play the same card. I'm talking to me, and I'm talking to you. And we are tempted to look inward. We are tempted to listen to ourselves. We are tempted to follow our hearts, which coincidentally always seems to line up with our desires. Isn't that interesting? We are tempted by self-authority, self-autonomy, autonomy, where we then become the final judge in our life, where we become the final judge in our spiritual lives, where what we want becomes the most important thing, our desires, our wants in terms of our spiritual lives. And we play these games left and right, and we fall right into the schemes of the devil. He laughs at us. The devil wants nothing more than to turn you into an idolatrous narcissist, okay? 
and he plays on it like crazy, and he's really good at it, and we just walk right into it because we think, oh, yeah, freedom, it's great. Friends, can I also say spiritual self-authority is anarchy? Anarchy in our own lives? Because we are then held back by our own thoughts, which are ever-changing. We are held captive to our ever-changing emotions, our ever-changing roller coaster of ideas. And we ride this roller coaster of self-condemnation and self-flattery and all these things. We play all these games. And this cycle of self-authority goes round and round and round and round. And we're constantly looking inward. And the only result is spiritual wreckage. Here's the deal. Confession time. You know what? I'm, I'm a selfish guy. I, I am. I, I, I love my way to pursue self-preservation. I, I love to self-justify myself. Just ask my wife when we get into arguments, right? I, I, I don't like being wrong. I am egotistical. I am selfish. I love to just do that in my own strength. That's who I am in my own strength. Here's the thing. I need an authority outside of my life. I need an authority outside of me. I need an authority outside my emotions. I need an authority outside of my experience. I need an authority outside of my opinions. I need an authority outside of my ideas and outside of my preferences. I need an authority that is not subject to my subjectivity. And that authority is what? The written word of God. God's authority is not found in some privatized experience where I sort of just feel goosebumps about things. God's authority is not found in some book that you picked off of Amazon that claims that God is speaking through it, other than the Bible. God has located, literally located, his authority in his word that we have, the written word. Listen to this again. All scripture is breathed out by God. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. There's so much here in this passage, we're not going to get to everything here. But note the simplicity of this verse. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is a written word. They're inspired by God. It comes from Him, which is why it carries with it authority. Authority not because I say so. Authority because not some church says so. Authority because it derives from the mind and the heart of God, the very one who through His word created the heavens and the earth. The one who created you, the one who knows you so intimately, and the one who knows exactly what you need. All Scripture is breathed out by God. It's inspired. It is given. It's the sword of the Spirit, as Paul says. But there is that little word that we kind of find irritating, that word all, right? Because our flesh, right, we, we don't like the universal implications of that word all, right? And here's another area of the schemes of the devil trying to get us at. We can handle God's authoritative word when it talks about heaven, when it talks about good stuff, salvation, peace, and hope, and all that other things that give us psychological goosebumps. We like all that. We like the authority there. But we, it is easy for you and I to recoil when the word says things that we don't like, when it's counterculture, when it defines truth, when it exposes sin in my life, when it exposes things in our society, when it opens me up and it lays me bare and I see the re dreadful reality of myself. We don't like that. But guess what? Whether I like it or not, it's entirely irrelevant. <laughs> right? I mean, goosebumps are not the barometer of truth. A police officer might give me a fine for speeding and I don't like it, but that doesn't change the reality because it comes from a, an authority outside of myself. You know, it really doesn't mean a whole lot to, to any of us here if you and I get warm fuzzies when we read the Bible. Obviously, it's good for us to like it. But that's not the main issue. The main issue is do we acknowledge this is authority in my life? Do we acknowledge that this is God himself speaking to me? God who has given us his word. And I need this as creation. It's that simple, authority. And we shut our mouths and we listen to the word of the king. Authority. The source of that word defines the authority. Again, all scriptures breathed out by God. You and I, we both need God's word in our lives. We need his absolute outside of ourselves authority to fight our inner desire for self authority. Does that make sense? We need its teaching, its reproof, its correction. We need the objectivity and this intense diagnostic ability of God's word because without it, we are always left looking inward and we are left to the endless barrage of our narcissistic desires. The word, the word of the spirit here, 
The sword of the Spirit is God's word. It stands today. It is true and it's necessary. And it does battle against ourself. It does battle against error. And it does battle against the schemes of the devil. No other word's going to do that. No other word's going to do that. Now, let's be fair. We're going to kind of build this up today a little bit. Often, I think we actually get this part right. We confess the authority of the word. We, we use, we're really good in the church of using words like inerrancy and infallible. And we have all these words that talk about the authority of the word of God. And, and we can say things like, yes, the scriptures are, are the blueprints for our lives. And, and we want to study them, right? And we use these cute little things called the Bible, basic instructions for leaving earth, right? And, and we all get it. We see this as instructions, but we stop there. We can't stop there. We must not and never stop there. So back to our question. Why are the scriptures a weapon in spiritual warfare? Number one, again, they remain authoritative. But two, adding to the argument, the scriptures confess Christ. Look again at this text here. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. Notice the intent there. The purpose. It's all about Christ, salvation in Christ. You could bring another passage in from the end of the uh, Gospel of John. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not in this book. But these are written, why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then by believing you may have life in his name. And you can think of all over the place where this sort of rings true. Think of the road to Emmaus, right? Where Jesus is walking. And what is he doing? He's expounding the entire Old Testament. And he says, this is all about me, guys. And I'm afraid so often... In the conservative evangelical world, we miss this, right? I mean, we talk about inerrancy, we talk about authority, but we miss Christ. I mean, take a stroll through your local Christian bookstore if you can find one, or just look at publishers, and you'll think that the Bible is all about you. It's all about morality. It's all about having our best life now. It's, how, it's all about how to do this and how to do that and how to have a better 401k plan and a better prayer life and a better marriage and all these things. And I can pound the pulpit up here until my hand breaks, proclaiming the authority of Scripture. I can write books and I can defend, proclaim inerrancy and how it is absolutely true. I can use the Scriptures to talk about morality and all types of things that are true and helpful. But just because I believe in the authority of Scripture and just because I use buzzwords like inerrancy doesn't mean that I've actually got the point of Scripture in my heart. If I miss Christ, I miss the gospel and inerrancy is meaningless. The word of God, the sword of the spirit, is all about Jesus from start to finish. Jesus Christ, who was promised all throughout the Old Testament. Jesus Christ, who was typified and foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who went to the manger. Jesus Christ, who lived 33 years of sinless perfection, fulfilling the law perfectly for you. Jesus Christ, who willingly then took your and my just punishment on the cross, who took the full force of the wrath of God because of sin, who rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, who ascends into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, who speaks on behalf of his children, who declares the forgiveness of sins to those that he knows that he's already won, who meets his people through his word and sacraments, who is promising to come again. It's all about Jesus, Genesis to Revelation. That's the whole reason the scriptures are given. And why is this important? Because anything less does nothing for my true spiritual need. I don't need, again, more lessons on morality. I don't need more lessons on financial guidance. I don't need basic instructions before leaving earth. I don't need more relational advice. I can figure that all out through observation, natural law, Google, YouTube, and Dr. Phil. Honestly, it's all there. It's all there. What I do need, though, is Christ. I need to hear, and I need to read about Jesus saying to me, you are a mess. <laughs> Your sins are forgiven, though. I love you. You are mine. Come follow me. I need to hear and I need to read about Jesus saying, come, dine at my table with me. I need to hear about his love and his mercy in the midst of all my failures. I need to hear about Jesus, who is my divine warrior, and how he is the truth, and how he is the righteousness, and how he is the salvation, and how he then fights against the schemes of the devil, and how he triumphs. I need to hear that. Praise the Lord for the scriptures, for in them Christ is confessed. Even that's not far enough, though. All right, so we got two. We got the question: Why the scriptures? 
a weapon in spiritual warfare, number one, because they are authoritative. They are the words of the king, and we shut up and listen. Number two, it's all about Christ. But that is not far enough. Why else? Number three, because the scriptures actually do something. The scriptures deliver Christ. Again, we, as I talked with the kids, it's very easy to approach the Bible like any other book, right? We have all been influenced with the idea that the material and the spiritual world are distinct and separate. I mean, how could something so physical, it's got a leather border and it's got words on a page and physical paper, how can something so physical carry with it or do something so deeply spiritual? And so perhaps it is so easy for us to fall in the trap thinking that the Bible is simply just like a regular book. It's a spiritual book. It's full of true and accurate information. It's information about God, yes, information about truth, that's good, information about salvation, inf information about morality, even information about Jesus, right? It's the resource that we go to. It's got wisdom for life to have all these things. It is this timeless, eternal catalog of spiritual teachings and truths, and we need all that information, it's like a math student using a math textbook full of true and accurate information which helps them navigate life. This is what the Bible is for us. It tells about Christ. We need to know about that. But friends, the scriptures are unlike any other kind of written word. You see, the scriptures aren't simply information, but the scriptures do stuff. They're active. They're powerful. Look at the text again here. Paul alludes to it here. It says, which are able, which are able to make you wise for salvation. And he talks about teaching, and reproof, correction, training. These are all things that the word is doing. Uh, Hebrews 4 gets at this a little bit better. Another familiar passage, Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's not a dead thing. That's not a bland word. That is not like any other word. It is sharp, it's powerful, it's living. Or Romans 10, we think about that one. Faith comes through hearing, Hearing through what? The word of Christ. The sword of the spirit that Paul is alluding to, it is a spirit word. The written word conveys what it says. It actually does what it says. The word is identified as Jesus himself. He is the word, and he is the word that is given through the word. It's pretty cool. And this is something we celebrate. We really believe that, that something that is material can truly actually deliver something that is spiritual. The church has always confessed this. All throughout the Old Testament, we see this. This is one of the reasons why the sacraments are so beautiful, something real and something we can touch and taste, and yet they're connected to promises of God, right? Interestingly enough, the sacraments are called the visible word. The word of God is a sacramental word. It is a performative word. It actually does something. It is living and inactive, and it does something that it says it does. And it is necessary that it does those things because you and I cannot do those things. And through the word, the spirit and the word are united. And it comes and it breaks me, a proud sinner, and it exposes me and it kills me. And then it makes me alive in Christ. It actually gives the gospel. It gives Christ. It doesn't just announce something. It creates something. It's beautiful. And it comforts us. Friends, as you take up your Bible and you open your Bible, as you're reading printed words in English on physical sheets of paper, God, who is living and active through the Holy Spirit, is actually present, speaking to you through his word, actually working stuff, conviction of sin, faith, comfort, all this, delivering the goods. It's a great passage in Jeremiah 20, 23. Later today, you guys go back and I'll read Jeremiah 23. It's so good. And, and God is contrasting the dead words of the prophet with his word. And he says this in Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. God's word is fire. The scriptures, the word of the spirit, the word is performative. It delivers the goods. It delivers Christ. It actually works this reality in us. And we are hopeless without that. If the Bible is just simply a mere textbook of information, none of us would be alive in Christ. The spirit of God takes his word and actually does stuff. Why is this important? <laughs> Why is this important? Why is this third part so significant? Why is this third aspect that we believe that the scriptures actually are living matter? Because 
what happens is that it changes my posture from mere curiosity to dependence, okay? If, if I just simply believe that the scriptures are authoritative, which is good, that's, that's, that's kind of a win, right? I'll be like, okay, interesting. I'm going to read about them. If I believe, okay, they're talking about salvation history. It's about Jesus. Okay, yeah, he's son of God, all this stuff. Okay, that's good too. Curiosity. But all of a sudden, I add this aspect. This is actually a performative word that does stuff. It's going to change me to be dependent. I want this. I need this. Right? It's entirely, it's entirely transformative into our approach to the word. I, I might be on those first two sides, and I might read the word every once in a while, but I'm going to suffer for it. I'll probably study it. That's oh, interesting material. But the reliance there, the dependence, eventually is going to fade. There's a good chance over time I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to skip. I might start looking elsewhere for something that's maybe more exciting, maybe something that speaks to my emotions a little bit more because I, I know that I need that, right? I'm always going to be looking on that steady diet for the latest thing that God is supposed to be saying if I'm just stuck in that first and second slot. God does not want you that way. It does you no good, Right? which is why then he has actually given us something more. He has actually located himself in his word, and he promises to speak through that word, to create faith, to create life through the gospel word. <laughs> have you noticed so much today in the conservative evangelical worship services actually don't have a lot of word in them? Have you ever noticed that? It's a lot of music and self-help talk. Which is why if you look back at the historic church all the way and then the Old Testament, from start to finish, all it is is the word of God. All it is is the word of God. Even if the sermon stinks, <laughs> you've got the word of God because the word of God actually does stuff. And it's so practical, so precious, so sweet, so relevant. And if you're like me, and I think you all are because you're human, you struggle with sin. You then beat yourself up because of that sin. You get frustrated because of that sin. You get discouraged because of that sin. You get frustrated because of your poor spiritual performance. And then you struggle and you start doubting, okay, does God actually love me? And all this stuff, and all along here, the devil and his minions are attacking you and pour, pouring all this lies from him on you, spiritual warfare. We've been talking about that for weeks. We all deal with this. You and I desperately need the word of the Spirit in our lives. We desperately need the word of the Spirit in this fight. Because through the word, the sword of the Spirit, Jesus comes as that divine warrior and he stabs right into my failure. <laughs> and he says, Andy, your sins, yeah, they're ugly. But I've taken them. I've forgiven them. Arise, you are new. He stabs right into it through his word. Through his word, the word of the spirit, he stabs right into all my doubts and all my failure and all my anxiety and all of my narcissism. He just rips right into it. And he creates and he strengthens faith and assurance in Christ. He actually is doing what he says he's going to do. Through the word of the Spirit, then, he takes aim and he stabs right into error. And he stabs into deception. And he stabs into the schemes of the devil that completely plague us every single day. And he stabs into them with Christ, who is the truth, who is righteousness, who is salvation, all the things we've been talking about. Friends, if that is the truth, if that is the reality, how important it is for you and for me to be in the word. Not your word, not my word, God's word. We need it every day. We're really good at shortchanging ourselves here. We're really good at thinking, oh, I don't really need it. Oh, it's just more information on this or whatever. No, it is a lifeline. You and I need it every day because we need Christ every day. And it is my prayer and my hope and desire then that you and I would daily cherish and rejoice the gift of the written word. It is a gift for you. The God of the universe actually speaking to you and to me through this physical book or an app on our phone. And that with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving, we would seek to consume the word and consequently then allow the word to consume us. Fully trusting and embracing that this is the word of the king creating life in me. Invite us to take a few moments just reflecting on that, reflecting on maybe our sin and our need for Christ, and then we'll pray together from Psalm 51.
Let's join together and pray the confession from Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit with me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Father, thank you that you have given us your word. You have not left us wordless. You have not left us with simple natural revelation, nature, the beauty, which still proclaims you, but that you have given us a specific word, a divine word that actually proclaims who you are, but not only proclaiming who you are, actually delivering who you are. Thank you, Father, that you work, that this word is living, it is active, and that you work faith, you work life, you work conviction of sin, you work reproof and correction for training in righteousness, literally everything we need, you work in your word. Father, I pray for everyone here, Lord, I pray that we would all be reflecting on maybe our apathy to that word. Now, some, some are better than others at planting themselves in the word. Father, I pray for everyone here, Lord, that they would recognize that your word is a lifeline for us. Lord, it's so easy to be frustrated with our own failures. It's so easy for us to be paralyzed by our poor performance spiritually and not to use the very thing that you had given to us to fight. It's so easy for us to just just languish in our inadequacy and languish in our self-loathing and then try to fix it ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word, the sword of the spirit that is alive to diagnose and to give and to heal and to bring life. So I pray for everyone here, Lord, that they would reflect, that we would all reflect on our, our time spent with you and your word. And Lord, that you would grant us uh, just a vision for transformation that you desire in all of our lives as disciples. And then you would work that desire starting even today in the days to come. Thank you, Father, even that you forgive our inadequacy there too. And Lord, that as we confess our sins, you know all about this and proclaim to us the grace that you earned and provided for at the cross that our sins might be forgiven in you by faith. To restore us and give us joy today that we might then search after you with peace and independence. In Jesus' name, amen.